exposed how Nigerian government gave indicated cocaine trafficker multi-million dollar contract to supply passport to citizens. Welcome to the news. The investigation which was done by Nigerian journalist David Hunde and reported by West Africa Weekly delves delves into how the rot in the system led to an embarrassing scarcity of passports for Nigerians at home and abroad. The report exposes the rot, racketeering, ethnic nepotism, complete failure of due diligence, and how an indicated cocaine trafficker has come to control the supply of passports to Nigerian citizens. The investigation, which was done by Nigerian journalist David Hundeyin and reported by West African Weekly, delves into how the rust in the system led to an embarrassing scarcity of passports for Nigerians at home and abroad. We acknowledge and apologize for the challenges faced in the past few weeks regarding passport booklets availability. I am glad to inform you that the booklets are now available and are being distributed to all our passport issuing centers. With this was on March 31st, former Comptroller General of the Nigerian Immigration Service, NIS, Abadende verbally signed the check that the NIS was subsequently failed to cash. Through the course of his tenure as CG, Nigeria had become used to chronic passport booklet shortage and the associated black market arbitrage, but the, but the shortage had become acute by 2021. He needed to make a statement to reaffirm his competence. Speaking at the commissioning of the Maitema Passport Express Center, itself a masterclass in formalized black market arbitrage, Baba Dende made that, made that statement and then some. A special team will be dispatched to facilitate enrollments and production of passports across Nigeria and its foreign missions. New passport officers to service air passengers will be seated at the will be sited at the airports in Lagos, Kanu, and Abuja. The new premium passport processing center in Abuja will cut the length of passport insurance and renewal from several weeks to just 72 hours. Ultimately, Baba Dende's statement turned out to be just a statement. From when he made this pronouncement until his retirement earlier this month, passport booklet continued to be a scarce and expensive commodity in Nigeria. Several factors were blamed for the baffling inability of Africa's most populous country to provide passports for its citizens. Chronic corruption at the NIS, dispute between the NIS and a private contractor responsible for printing booklets, scarcity of forex to pay for security printing materials, even an alleged unofficial government policy to stay in brain drain by making passports hard to access. All this have variously been blamed for this state of affairs. And it's so often why the case in Nigeria, no theory or explanation should be dismissed out of hand. Which is why when I sent out to find out what is really behind the perennial shortage of this little green booklet, I was prepared for anything. Or at least I thought I was. What would emerge as is what would emerge? As I sank my teeth into this, however, was not a story about supply chain disruption or government inefficiency. It was nothing like I have ever I had ever seen before, which is saying something. Think Transformers meets Black Mirror, meets Karishika with protagonists who are Pat Elon Mox, Pat Lawrence Anini, and Pat Bakinzuwo. There is a new murder in New York. A million dollar cocaine deal in Bogota. Court cases in New Jersey. A legitimate high tech manufacturing operation in Kuala Lumpur. Art exhibition in Lagos. High society marriages. Prominent placements in lifestyle and celebrity magazines. And the most comically brazen law breaking hidden in plain sight. If the story were a movie, it would be the conceptual offering of Michael Bay and Ugezu Je Ugezu, which is to say low on plot and purpose, but high on share, crash bang value. There are three main characters in this story. The existence and relevance was determined after speaking to five different sources within the NIS ecosystem. These three more than any other people have had the most influence on passport issuance and the wider state of the immigration service 
Unsurprisingly, the first name on the list is immediate past CG Mohammed Babadinde. None of my sources have, ev have any especially nice words to say about him. But neither do any but neither do they have any bitter personal complaints either. The impression that comes through about Baba Dende is that of a fundamentally limited man who is neither vicious nor especially malevolent. As one of the sources puts it frankly, he tried to make some moves such as the passport express centers, but it did not work. It did not work out because he was there to make money because he, before he retired. He did not really care about fixing any systematic issues like staff motivation or the ISTL contracts. All that was was not his business. The sources informed me that under Baba Dende's tenure, complete opacity was institutionalized with immigration officers now, not even knowing how much to expect on their pay slip at the end of a month. Apparently, during his tenure, NIS staff were immigrated to the Integrated Payroll and Personal Information System, IPPIS, and with that went any sort of transparency regarding staff pay scales, deductions, and entitlements. As a source colorfully puts it during one of our long conversations, it has now got to the point that you don't know what will come in at the end of the month, and whatever it is that comes in, you just have to take it like that. The deductions vary every month, so we do not know how much we take home. So tell me as a man with people depending on you, how else will you survive if not through a gunje bribes? While the sources mention different things that Baba, Baba Dende could have done to protect any other staff welfare and morale, they all have one consistent criticism of him, his allergic ethnocentric posting policy. During his tenure, they say, desirable NIS postings such as NIS offices, NIS offices in Lagos were given exclusively to Northerners. While the Southerners working there were all posted out, the Ikoyi Immigration Office, I am told, is now staffed almost exclusively by Northerners, a state of affairs that would be impossible if the rules were reversed. Under Baba Dende and even in these early days of his successor, Idris Jere, the sources say, many Northerners in the NIS, encouraged by the prebendalist disposition of their superiors, are keen to let everyone know that it is their turn and they are in power. Following Idris Jere's appointment, a source claims the next most senior deputy controller, a Southerner from Lagos, who might have been next in line to succeed Jere, was promptly transferred to Sokoto. At press time, I have been unable to independ ind independently, I beg your pardon, verify this. The other name that every source mentioned in a certain, is a certain layman at the Ikoyi passport office. None of the sources bother to hide how they feel about this fellow. This man and his extreme racketering, they say, is one of the major reasons behind Nigeria passport shortage. A piece of research brings up his name as Abdullahi. I, Lehman, a deputy controller in charge of the Ikoyi passports, passports command of the NIS. Every single source has a terrible story to tell about Abdullahi Lehman. Lehman, they say, is responsible for the northernization of the Ikoyi passports command. Even worse, one source tells me, under Lehman's tenure, the atmosphere at the command has taken on explicitly polarized ethnic and religious overtones. Take these anecdotes from one of the sources, for example. You can imagine that you're in the middle of doing a capture, then all of a sudden your colleague who is upset capturing will just stand up and leave his station with a crowd of people there because he said he is going to pray. You now end up doing his work for him. Can you imagine that? This does not happen before Lehman came in. Lehman, they say, is in the habit of pointedly using Hausa to converse with his subordinates at work, which automatically puts every southerner working under his command at a real career disadvantage. Speaking English or, in fact, any other language but Hausa at work is now a career demerit at the Ikoi passport common under Lehman's watch. A few days after I speak to this source, the story by the Foundation for Investigation for 
investigative journalism was published de detailing persecution of a southern NIS officer at the Ikoyi command in the exact ways described by my sources. Notice the reporter's description of his reaction, interaction with Lehman. Up to this point, I have relied on testimony from sources I consider trustworthy, but even their knowledge of affairs at the NIS has its limits. Why people like Abdullahi Liman are running rockets within the NIS to restrict access to passport booklets in large population. Censors like Lagos so as to create a lucrative black market. The sources are also clear that they believe that the NIS simply does not have enough passport booklets. To truly understand why the NIS appears to have not just a distribution problem, but also a supply problem with passport booklets. I had to figure out whose interest was served by the status quo. First, a brief premise on how Nigeria's passport system works. Starting in 2003, Nigeria adopted the e-passport standard to defeat counterfeiting results in a contract awarded to IRIS, Smart Technology Limited, which commenced in, 20, in 2007. The scope of the contract was to implement the Nigeria Harmonized ECOWAS Electronic passport auto gate systems, as well as to supply e-books, e-passport booklets, wafers, laminates, and maintenance services from 2006 and 15, and 2015. ISTO is affiliated with Malaysia Iris Corp, which carries out the actual security printing services, including supply of e-passport booklets. The services that the ISTO renders to the NIS, including creating and maintaining the electronic database containing the passport details of Nigerian citizens, as well as maintaining the communication infrastructure that keeps a constant uplink between passport registration offices and ISTO data center. In case the reader has not seen the problem with this, allow me to spell it out clearly. A private company working for a private incentive has has full and unrestricted access to the sensitive data of all Nigerian passport holders, but more importantly, it alone has access to this data. In other words, ISTO has more access to passport holders' data than the NIS itself. ISTO does not actually produce pa passport booklets, but subcontracts production to the Malaysian firm, firm Iris Corp. Essentially, this company that most people have never heard of controls the valuable sovereign database exclusively and all it has to do is maintain a few dozen closed VSAT links from passport registration centers, essentially tech support. This is in fact cost, cost a roll between the NIS and the company in 2017 when the 10-year contract came up for renewal. Speaking to Daily Trust in 2017, some INAI insiders claimed the following, that the initial contrast was a threat to national security because it vests control of the country signing certification authority, CSCA, an official government seal in ISCL instead of Nigerian government, which on paper is a rig factor for fraud. That its implementation did not follow due process that the database and other infrastructure was paid by the Nigerian government, but ISTL holds them to government property and uses tactics such as refusing to train NIS officers in the management of a system as a way to strong-arm the government into renewing its contract. That NIS officers cannot conduct basic maintenance and repairs on the ICTL system, meaning that Nigerian Governments cannot withdraw from ICTL contracts without incurring catastrophic costs, which violate public procurement regulations. That the contract has questionable exclusion clauses that gave undue advantage to ISTL at the expense of the Nigerian taxpayer. The Malaysian company subcontracted by the ISTL to print the booklets, meanwhile, has found itself facing corruption corruption probes by Malaysian authorities over its activities in other African e-passport jurisdictions, such as Guinea. So putting this picture together, we have a tech support company that has somehow raggled its way into a $138 million 10-year government contract, which was eventually renewed in 2019. 
Its main activity is maintaining equipment and an electronic database and its subcontract passport booklet, booklet printing to a company halfway around the world whose executive have been arrested on corruption charges. For the purpose of balance, it must be pointed out that the 138 million figure is not paid by the government, but rather comes from the company's revenue generation activities within the scope of the e-passport project. It is also important to point out that the criticisms of the ISTL contract we are, made pos we are possibly made in bad faith by individuals who merely wanted to replace ISTL with their own companies. Indeed, the senior NIS official quoted by the Daily Trust in 2017 remarked, the controversy is between contractors who won the contract. The NIS concern is simply the supply of the booklets. It is also important to mention that the cost of subcontracting IRS call to print the booklets is paid in U.S. dollars. Why ISCO's revenue comes in Naira, with the CBM revising to provide forex for the company. This, I am reliably informed, is the material reason behind the chronic booklet short shortages since 2017. The cost of printing passport booklets has more than doubled in dollar, ter in dollar terms since 2015. Hence, ISCO simply cannot afford to print as many booklets as before. With that being said, we now know that there is an incredibly lucky or powerful entity behind ISCL. Who is this person? This is where the story takes a few on. So hold your hearts. Hi, society gentleman or ex cocaine trafficker. On its website, ISTL described itself as a major subsidiary of the flagship company Image Technologies Limited, Image Tech. A quick CAC database check on Image Tech brings up exclusive data, exclusive character, I beg your pardon, behind the curtain. For a legal socialite, Olayin Kafisha is a man who somehow keeps a decidedly low profile. For one thing, while researching this story, establishing what exactly his name is turns out to be quite a task. In some places, he is Yinka Fisher. In some other places, he is Olayinka Fisher. In, in still other places, he is Olayinka Fisker or Sonayo Fisker, Fisher. Only in a few places that he would rather the world did not know about. Does his full and correctly spoiled government name appear? Olas Yinka Sonayo Fisher. So who is this guy and what is there to him? The story starts in Mr. Fisher prefers iteration as a high-flying Nigerian diplomat in mid to late 1970s at the time when he was still known to the world as Olayen Kasuna Fisher. He was the second secretary of the Nigerian mission to the United Nations. Researching the many variants of his name, Online references to his diplomatic career can be seen right up until 1980, when he seems to vanish off the face of the historical F. In 1989, he resurfaces on CAC's document in Nigeria as the majority shareholder in a new company called Image Tech. Presumably at this point, the high-achieving diplomat has decided to pivot into a career in tech entrepreneurship. Nigeria being what it is, nobody ever really bothered to ask why. And by 2003, he signed the contract above for ISTL under President Olusegun Obasanjor. The good times are rolling following the end of his marriage to River State Skion Doris Amaturi, a West Dr. Pius Okibo's daughter, Anne. He becomes an avid art collector and patron of the arts. He hosts art exhibitions with the Spanish Embassy in Lagos, which are co-created by both of his sons who share his love of the visual arts. To all intents and purposes, he is the SI unit of the classy and respectable old money Lagosian. There's just one problem. According to U.S. court records, Mr. Fisher allegedly used to be part of an intercontinental cocaine smuggling ring. I obtained the following document from the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey. The detailed court proceedings from a 1983 case involving a violent drug dealer wanted for a murder in the Bronx, New York, 
a successful American businessman who dabbled into the illegal drug business with them, with him and a Nigeria diplomat who used his diplomatic immunity to traffic shipments of cocaine into the U.S. on behalf, on their behalf, the diplomat's, diplomat's name is Satin Olayinka Shunayon Fisher. <laughs> According to Tracy Wong, the indicted American businessman, he paid Fisher the sum of $50,000 for a single shipment. The indictment further states that the arrangement lasted for at least two years with multiple cocaine trafficking trips made worth several million dollars. Exactly how much Fisher made from this arrangement in total is a question only he can answer, but it certainly raises a few interesting questions. Perhaps the most telling part of this story is the following is that following the release of the this NYT article and its subsequent exit from the diplo diplomatic corps, Fisher appears to have intentionally dropped all mention of Sonia, Sonoya from his name. In fact, he took the extraordinary step of making few calls to my hometown, Badagri, where the name Sonoya also originates from to confirm his identity. The fact that this has somehow slipped under the radar for decades despite his custody of one of the most sensitive databases in Nigeria is a sign of catastrophic failure of state intelligence and due diligence. <laughs> Making this point further, I speak to a lawyer, Solomon Igbarasi, to give his professional opinion on this issue. He points out that according to the Public Procurement Act 2007, someone with Fisher's background should have been disqualified from the public procurement process. In his words, falsification of facts can be interpreted to also include drug trafficking, carrying out drug trafficking under any guise we constitute f uh, falsification of facts that he concedes packages inside inside diplomatic purchase certainly qualifies as falsification of facts again the section said falsification of facts relating to any matter so there we so there we have it possibly the most mind bending story in nigeria's rich history of doggy public procurement and contracting for added measures the third person in the drug ring 